wonderful. Okay. And I'm going to make sure that I can see everything. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to the GDC. Thank you to the GDC for having me. Um, I really appreciated the, the kind of points of unity. I think that people will immediately see um, a reflection in the past in those points of unity. I think that you could have easily had those points of unity in 1905 and everybody would have um, um, uh, um, nodded their head. Uh, it wouldn't have been out of place at all. In fact, um, the general defense committees were um, originally an organ of the uh, industrial workers of the world. We'll see just a little bit about them. So tonight we're going to be taking a very brief look at the radical and left press more or less between 1890 with a pretty hard stop in 1924. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to be, the, the left press is a, a vehicle for looking at the history of the left because the left press is uh, in many ways where that history is lived out, uh, where it's recorded. Um, but the, we're not going to be directly talking about the history of the left. Rather, we're going to be talking about the history of the left press. I recognize that the overlap is is total, but uh, I just to be clear that we're not going to be talking about every split, every all, all of that kind of thing. And so much of of the story is going to be left out. We're just going to be hitting the highlights. And today uh, is Martin Luther King Day, uh, and I just wanted to say something about that um, because the central figure of the period we're going to be talking about is Eugene Victor Debs. And Eugene Debs and MLK are, are similar in, in different ways. Um, but in the way that they're most similar in my mind is, is that they can be all things to all people in some ways. There's the Christian Debs, there's the Christian MLK, there's the revolutionary Debs, there's the revolutionary MLK. Um, uh, but they're central figures. Everybody relates to them. Because Debs is the central figure, I'm not going to be playing, paying a huge amount of attention to Debs tonight, which is uh, uh, not a diss on Debs, but <laughs> an assumption that some of us know about Debs already, and, and you can find out more about Debs uh, um, uh, 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 on your own. Debs is the figure behind a lot of this, though. Uh, he, is, he is a major, major figure in this period, uh, and you define yourselves for and against Debs in so many ways. Uh, so when everything seemed possible, and I think that's one of the things that we're going to look at tonight is there is a revolutionary Marxist tradition uh, that goes well far beyond back, uh, beyond the Russian Revolution. The Russian Revolution did not create a communist tradition in this country. It affected an existing tradition. And uh, that tradition, that Marxist tradition, is what the communist movement came out of, what the revolutionary movement came out of. It wasn't a new movement. It was defined and redefined by other experiences, the Russian Revolution, the German Revolution, what happened here in America, Mexico. Um, but there was a very vibrant uh, uh, Marxist tradition in this country. And that Marxist tradition like all Marxist traditions, was trying to find their way to class and to the power, you know, and to power. And this is before we have Marxist-Leninism, right? This is before we have an idea of a, um, a Marxist approach to party building in the, in the kind of way we do now, where we think that some of us at least think there's a kind of template built by Lenin on that. There was no template right before so what is the template and people are reaching towards um uh, uh, these questions they're reaching towards the answers uh uh what is the relationship between party politics and the class struggle what is the relationship between parliamentary po politics and uh unionism what is the relationship between individuals and the party all of these kinds of things that we're still dealing with were being dealt with then uh, and uh, the conclusions people came up with were conclusions, I think, that are really still very relevant for us today. Uh, and they brought those conclusions with them into the communist movement. And the communist movement, in fact, will continue to be divided uh, well into its, its life by the uh, past traditions in this country and where they came from. The other thing to really remember as we're talking tonight is uh, you know, a lot of us scratch our heads and go, why in the world do Marx pay so much attention to industrial unions and industrial workers? Well, there was a time when they didn't. 
<laughs> and there was a time when the big debate was, who, do we pay attention to them at all? And how do we pay attention to them? Because remember, at one point, industrial, un, industrial work was a brand new thing, right? How do you relate to this brand new thing, this brand new way of production, this brand new way of working? And there were not clear-cut answers to that. Um, but one of the things to remember as we're talking is that uh, Marxism did not begin with an orientation to industrial workers, uh, at least the politically active Marxists here. Uh, the industrial workers had to force that orientation onto them, and then other political things had to happen. So as we begin, uh, let's look at this photo or this uh, image here, and all of the journals we're going to be looking at tonight will be uh, publicly available. They're not going to be behind any paywalls. You will be able to find them online. We can talk about where you can find them later. But everything you see here, you would be able to read yourself and investigate yourself. And I do encourage uh, folks to do that. And one last thing as a way of introduction, as I understand, some comrades are watching the movie Red. And um, I'm actually going to make that your homework for tonight, <laughs> because that is a fantastic uh, uh, picture of uh, the politics and the personalities that we're going to be talking tonight about. Many of the leading characters in, in that film, Max Eastman, Floyd Dell, John Reed, Louise Bryant, are leading characters in this story we're going to be talking about tonight. So uh, before the hammer and sickle, what was the symbol of international socialism? It was the, this hand holding the, the torch of freedom or the torch of enlightenment. So you'll see this symbol all over the socialist movement in the United States going back to the 1870s. It would be the symbol of the Socialist Party, the symbol of the Socialist Labor Party, the symbol of many, many different parties. So before the hammer and sickle, this was the ubiquitous symbol that meant international socialism. Uh, and here it is in the masses in 1912, and we will be talking about the masses. So let's first go in to some deep history. But before we do that, we're going to frame this and why are, what is the radical press? And the radical press, I think, is not just a way for organizations to organize, to put out their propaganda. It is not a way to uh, disseminate information. It is not even a way to organize the class. It is a way for the class to create itself for itself. Right. And look at these pictures. Look how important the press is now. Uh, one of the things I think about is when when we when I put this tonight out, uh, where did we advertise? It was advertised on Facebook. It was advertised on the boss's platform. Right. Uh, uh, but here, everybody had their own. The whole point was the workers are going to have their own platform and by creating their own platform, have their own voice. And by creating their own voice, they will speak for their interests as a class, not just their present needs, right? So their, their historic interests. So in my mind, all of revolutionary politics hinges on the question of the working class transferring, transforming itself from a class of itself, meaning reacting to its situation, uh, reacting as the working class within capitalism, to a working class for itself, trying to liberate itself from capitalism and in that process actually cease to be the working class, right? So the working class by liberating itself ceases to be the working class. It is the most liberatory idea I can imagine. Uh, women don't, women's liberation does not presuppose that we get rid of women. Black liberation certainly doesn't mean we get rid of black people. Workers liberation means we get rid of workers. They don't exist anymore. And look at how these newspapers form the identity of these people, not just their identity, but a common identity, because these newspapers are all in many of them in different languages. So here we see down here where people are wearing, having the one big union. We have a um, we have a Finnish language, a Yiddish language. We have two solidarity newspapers. Here we have Il Proletario, the Italian language newspaper. Here these are all um, uh, Yiddish speaking garment workers holding the Yiddish uh, Forwards newspaper in New York City. Here we have comrades of the Socialist and Labor Star armed to defend their press in West Virginia during the 1912-1913 uh, Cabin Creek strikes. 
So these newspapers are, again, they are a way to identify oneself as a member of a class larger than oneself. I don't need to speak Yiddish to know this man is my comrade. I don't need to speak Finnish to know that this worker is my comrade. Um, uh, so these publications were incredibly important. And I have to say, I see a lot of that attitude within uh, GDC, uh, a creating of a counter hegemony, creating of a counter culture, a working class liberatory culture. Again, these people were not putting their meetings out on Facebook or Instagram. They had their own vehicles to do that. And uh, I, one of the things I think about with the internet is it wasn't too long ago that there, people, there, there was the world of blogs. You got your left information, not through Facebook or Instagram, but straight to the leftist. That uh, golden age of the internet is now long gone. Uh, and, and we'll also see what happens to the working class publications. But to keep a working class publication alive, to keep a revolutionary publication alive, in some ways became synonymous with keeping the revolution alive uh, uh, in, you know, you know, in a bad way, right? In, in, not a, a, in not a liberatory way. But so I just want us to take in how important this press was, and especially important because at this time, the working class in this country is also deeply divided by language in a way that it is still divided by language, uh, but the multiplicity of languages spoken by the industrial working class at that time was far greater than it is today, uh, at least in the United States. And so that required a different kind of organizing. So let's go way, way back. And we're going to look at where did some of this start. So there have been socialist and Christian and utopian newspapers in the United States going all the way back since those ideas began. Um, but when we're talking about sort of social democratic, modern ideas of redistribution of working class power, modern ideas about the state, modern ideas about uh, a scientific notion of socialism, a scientific notion of economy and class. This is really a product of German uh, and European emigres to the United States, uh, the Red 48ers, the people who fled the, revol the failed revolutions of Europe in the 1840s. Those revolutions were fought and the, the, the revolutions that Marx participated in as a journalist and Engels participated in as a combatant. Um, and so many of those comrades of Marx and Engels, the larger workers' movement and revolutionary democratic movement of Europe ended up in the United States as refugees, and here they opened up their newspapers in, uh, in their own language. So the first socialist newspapers, what we would think of as communist, if not Marxist newspapers in this country are in German. And the, the most important one, because it's daily and it has the biggest impact, is August Village's Cincinnati Republicana. And in fact, if I were to point out if, if there is any moment in time that we can say the beginning of the modern left happens, it would be uh, uh, December 1859 in Cincinnati, when the Germans centered around the Republicaner, these radical German working class organizations, unite with black radicals to um, uh, commemorate the martyrdom of John Brown. Uh, and so you've got German socialists with African Americans with black people fighting the very American struggle of slavery. And that was written about in the pages of the Cincinnati Republicaner here. The Cincinnati Republicaner also is the first place that issues some of Marx's writings in the United States. So Marx's fantastic critique of political economy, which would not see an English edition until um, uh, Charles H. Kerr does it 50 years later, uh, will uh, be printed in uh, uh, Willich's Republicaner uh, in uh, Cincinnati, even though Willich had his own um, difficulties with Marx. Uh, another is uh, the, the San Antonio Zeitung, which is right down here. And uh, that's uh, um, for now, uh, uh, founded um, uh, by Douay over here. And uh, many Germans ended up of all places in West Texas. And many of these were including Marx's brother-in-law. They end up in West Texas, and uh, West Texas was about as friendly for radical Germans then as it is now, right? Uh, and um, and uh, the San Antonio Zeitung, in fact, the Germans in West Texas supported an independent free state, non-slave state in West Texas. 
You can imagine that went over like a lead balloon with the slave owning Anglos of Texas and Dwey had to get, get out of town pretty quick. Uh, his newspaper was burnt to the ground and a number of other things. So these are our first communist newspapers. They're both not Marxist, but come out of the Communist League and the, the uh, 1848 revolutions in Europe. And they're very significantly, they're not in English. And one of the things is if I'm doing history of the first international and Marxism in the United States, I actually can't because I don't read German. To be able to read German is the only way to be able to read about the history of Marxism in the United States up until about 1880. Okay, uh, so Marxist beginnings. Uh, so what we looked at before was communists, the, the communist league, this, this new notion of a working class communist. And now within that is Marxism. Uh, and uh, the first time the Communist Manifesto was actually printed in the United States is in 1877. Uh, and it's, no, it's not. It's in 1871. I'm sorry. And it's in uh, Victoria Woodhall and her sister's magazine, Woodhall and Clapham's here. You see Progress, Free Thought, Untrammeled Lives. Now, the Woodhalls are often derided uh, for their very, well, for their clearly middle class sort of politics and you know they were into free love and and vegetarianism and seances and all of that kind of stuff i don't mean to say anything's wrong with free love and vegetarianism so i'm not sure about seances but uh, they were idiosyncratic and they weren't the people that we would think of as marxists but they were members of the first international and even though they're often dismissed they are the people that first uh, published in English some of the most important texts of the of the European communist revolutionary movement. And here we see the first uh, uh, publication in the United States of the Communist Manifesto. And look at the first line, a frightful hobgoblin stalks throughout Europe. We are haunted by a ghost, the ghost of communism. Uh, all the powers of the past have joined in a holy crusade to lay the ghost to rest. So that's not the Communist Manifesto I know the words of, but it's a different translation, right? And so one of the things we have to remember is all of these things are being translated. And boy, can they be translated wrong. <clears throat> Daniel de Leon. Uh, we'll meet him in a little bit. Uh, uh, then um, the, the, the socialist movement here, the communist movement here, the workers' movement here, even among the Germans, was absolutely dominated not by Marxists, but Lasallians. And that's, we can't go into all of this, but Ferdinand LaSalle is an incredibly important working class, Jewish working class leader in Germany. Um, and he, um, he is really important for putting in front of the working class, the idea of an independent working class political party. Uh, he, uh, he believes that that's the way to fight, uh, 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 that workers should use the franchise, create their own political parties, and then contest elections uh, for their liberation. Now, that's, you know, <laughs> that, that sounds like parliamentarism, but at the time, you have to remember that it was a revolutionary struggle to get workers the franchise. So what we're talking about is a revolutionary struggle to open up democracy. And here, the vast majority of uh, the socialist movement is German speaking, uh, and they found in 1877 out of the Working Men's Party, and 1877 is a crucial year. So 1877 is both the high point of the 19th century working class struggle in the United States and the point at which it smashed, right? So it's both the high point and the point at which it smashed. 18, we often hear about the fail, you know, Reconstruction and uh, the white redemptionist uh, power, retaking power in the South. At the same time that is happening, we are talking about hundreds, if not thousands of workers being of workers in the north, largely white, many of which are immigrants are being shot down by the militias in the largest working class uprising up to that point in American history, the, the railroad uprising of 1877. So at the same time we see the smashing of uh, reconstruction in the south, we see this, the, the, the truly massive violence against the workers movement in the United States. We don't know how many thousands, hundreds or thousands of people died in the summer of 1877. Uh, we, we never will know. Um, but that is the year in which the Socialistic Labor Party was formed. And they chose an English speaking man to be their first corresponding secretary, Philip Van Patten, as a way to break out of their isolation. But the moment they're founded, they're in isolation as the workers movement is being smashed. Um, 
Uh, they had 24 newspapers developed between 1876 and 1877. They got about 30% of the vote for Chicago mayorship at that point. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, what happens is in the 1880s, the Haymarket movement and anarchism overwhelms the Marxists of the Socialist Labor Party and actually challenges Marxism in a very serious way. So here we get to what is going to be the real first sort of beginnings of Marxist newspapers in the, this country. And there is a figure who is incredibly important, and his name is Daniel DeLeon. And Daniel DeLeon is, has a very interesting past. He's Jewish, Dutch, Guianese, right? So he has a very interesting colonial slash European slash cosmopolitan past. Um, he comes to the United States. Uh, the Socialist Labor Party is the official section of the Second International in the United States. Uh, it is dominated even in the early 1890s by Lasallians uh, rather than Marxists. Um, they had a paper called The Working Men's Advocate. Uh, and uh, as they developed an orientation towards trade unions, uh, they began a new project um, uh, and a new paper. And they wanted to make sure they had a, a, a wide ranging national uh, uh, English language newspaper to back up their new trade union um, uh, um, um, uh, orientation. So the People was the official paper of the Socialist Labor Party, and it began in New York City in 1891 as a weekly. Its first editor was French socialist Lucia Sanal, and he was quickly replaced by Daniel de Leon. And Daniel de Leon is a particular character. Uh, he remolded the Socialist Labor Party in his own image. He put incredible stress on theoretical um, organizing and theoretical education. He was responsible for a huge numbers of extremely important translations of, for example, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte by Marx, early uh, translations of Engels. Now, the problem is De Leon translates these works into American conditions. So he doesn't just translate it, you know, he's not sitting, he, and he rewrites them all uh, in American conditions. And so often these rewritten works that are considered the fundamentals of Marxism by Marx and Engels and Kautsky and others are the translations of Daniel De Leon rather than the actual, and the, some of them are valuable. Some of them are not so valuable. His translation of the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte deserves to never be read again. Um, but some of his are really valuable. Um, but he is able to uh, uh, make theory important. And, and uh, in fact, if you don't do theory and if you don't do, devote your life to theory and a kind of Jesuitical, um, uh, um, discipline towards the party, you're not living like Daniel de Leon. And to live like Daniel de Leon is to be a real revolutionary. And uh, so the people, I don't want to completely, I don't want to dismiss Daniel de Leon. He is able to grow and, and, uh, uh, and, and create a cadre of, of Marxist thinkers. Uh, now, once these Marxist thinkers begin thinking for themselves, they bump into Daniel De Leon because Daniel De Leon really doesn't allow for thinking for yourself. So what you see is that the Socialist Party of America, led by Eugene Debs later, uh, will have its uh, foundation and the newspapers of the Socialist Party will have its foundation in dissidents within the Socialist Labor Party and the people, the editors of regional papers of the people. So people like Morris Hilquit, Henry Slobodin, uh, they will be editors of regional uh, socialist labor newspapers, and then they will become in opposition to Daniel De Leon, and they will create what are called social democratic federations. And these newspapers and social democratic federations will end up getting together in Indianapolis in 1901 to form the Socialist Party. That is an extremely short version of that process, but that's what happens. And uh, the other big thing about that is Debs leading the Pullman strike in 1894 and, and breaking definitively with the Democratic Party and the Populist Party and moving towards, um, well, not 
embracing an independent working class trajectory. So Debs, the, the foremost working class leader, also at the same time that this the, the, these splits are happening within um, the Socialist Labor Party, is developing his own independent uh, uh, political following. And they will come together to form the Socialist Party in 1901. Okay, so in the meantime, in the 1890s, as, as most people here will know, we get mass uh, migration to the United States. And that migration is significantly different than the migration even of the Red 48ers and even of the Irish of the 1840s. Um, we're talking about a, uh, a, a migration primarily of workers for industry. Uh, and many of them are being imported as labor straight from the old country, straight into the factory. So several of my family came to this country because um, employers went to, you know, wherever they were in Europe and signed them up to come here to work in Allentown or Butler or what, wherever in a steel mill. That's how so much of my family got here. That's how many, many other people got here, Ellis Island and all of that kind of stuff. So you're coming without property. You're coming not with the expectation of owning property, unlike those Germans and Irish of before, um, uh, or at least in part. Uh, uh, you're, you're coming as a, a worker and you're coming um, as not exactly white, right? You're coming into a country that defines itself on race and yet you are not going to be defined as white immediately. And so you're, you have room to maneuver in a way you didn't at the old country and a way that sort of white folks don't hear, Anglo folks don't hear, black folks don't have here. So what we find is, you know, I think a lot of us think that, you know, uh, Europeans brought radical European ideas with them and then that's how they were introduced here. Part of that is undoubtedly true, of course, but part of it is true that many Europeans got radicalized when they came here because of the, because of the reality of being an immigrant, right? And the reality of coming into a new country in which uh, the, which was different than your old country and which, which had uh, different sets of possibilities. And those different sets of possibilities were socialism. Uh, and of course, in Europe, we have working class parties and all of those kinds of things in ways that we don't in the United States then. So you have those notions already that many people are being brought with them. But then you come into the United States and many immigrants came to the United States and laid down their card and said, I want in. So it's, you know, it's not just simply that these are immigrants who came here. They came at a time in which there is a developing industrial working class and people are trying to figure out how that developing industrial working class will fit into the rest of the economy and fit into politics. And so what happens is that um, all of these communities develop their own uh, newspapers. And so we get an absolute explosion of what are called the language federations. And these this newspaper right here, which is the Yiddish Daily Forwards, it's daily at this point, and you can see Lenin and Trotsky there. Trotsky actually worked for Forwards for a while. Um, they will have a far higher circular, circular circulation uh, rate than most English language papers uh, up until, you know, until about 1910. So if you're reading about socialism and Marx in this country in, in 1900, chances are you're reading it in Swedish or you're reading it in Ukrainian. What do we have here? German, we have Czech, um, Danish, um, Yiddish. Uh, so these, these language federations were really important to the growth of socialism, to the growth of trade unionization, to the growth of industrial unionization uh, and to the growth of working class education. One of the problems is what unites, you, you know, one of the problems is the language federations organize on the basis of language, right? So it's necessarily insular, it's necessarily insular. But at the same time, people don't speak English, people need to organize within their own language groups, people need to organize with their own communities, and you also have real racism and xenophobia on the part of unions. Uh, uh, and the AFL and other places. So you're kind of forced also into a position of ghettoization at the same time uh, you embrace it, right? Um, uh, but one of the issues that will continue to plague, not plague, well, it will, it will become a big division within the movement is the relationship of the language federations 
to the larger movement? How much are the language federations going to keep their identity? How much are they going to assume their identity into the Communist Party, the Communist Labor Party, the Socialist Party, et cetera? Uh, there would not be socialism, a, a modern socialist movement in this country without these language federations. And I could even say it, there would not be a communist movement in this country without the Finnish language federation. I think it's in Michigan, certainly the Finnish language federation is is the majority of the communist movement well until the 1940s, well until the 1940s. And that will be true in a number of other areas where uh, certain groups of language federations like the Armenians or whatever will be central. In Detroit, uh, language federations do become incredibly strong. So language federations will be the only part of, well, not the only part, but one of the main parts of Detroit politics that will join the mainstream communist party. And we'll see that a little bit later. Okay, so daily regional socialist papers. I'm actually downplaying this a little bit because these aren't necessarily the revolutionary papers, but they are by far the most important papers. Uh, so the, again, these are the, as, as the socialist party and movement develops. And we go from, what, a couple hundred thousand votes in 1900 to half a million votes to nearly a million votes. So there is a large expansion of the Socialist Party. Uh, and uh, you begin to get daily English language socialist newspapers for the first time in U.S. history. So we've had uh, daily uh, um, German papers, we've had daily Yiddish papers, and by 1900, 1901, we're getting the first daily socialist papers uh, in the English language. The big, the big two are the Chicago Daily Socialist and the Call, and then uh, right behind that would be the various papers in Milwaukee, and then the third, which didn't last for that long, Daily Socialist paper is in Oakland, California. Uh, and these two people, here's uh, Morris Hillquit on the top right. He would be, uh, again, he comes out of the Socialist Labor Party. He would be not the not the right wing of the Socialist Party, but the constructivist wing of the Socialist Party, and he would become the editor of the New York Call. Morris Hillquit is an incredibly major figure in the socialist movement in this country, in the reformist socialist movement. He cannot be ignored. The Chicago Daily Socialist was also done for a little while by uh, uh, Hillquit, uh, but the Chicago Daily Socialist feels a little different than the Call. And again, all of these newspapers have their own feel, they have their own aesthetic, they have their own language that they use. Uh, and uh, the Chicago Daily Socialist feels a little more Midwestern <laughs> than the call. It feels a little more folksy than the call. Um, uh, and it feels a little more radical than the call. Um, the Here you see Keir Hardy speaking, and that's very much the world that the call is living in. You hear, here we have a Clarence Darrow uh, talk at the open shop. Here on the Daily Socialist, and this is important, Tell Taft to withdraw the troops from Me Mexico. We're talking about the Reformist Socialist Party of America, but they were absolutely the Socialist Party of America, opposed to U.S. foreign involvement in the Philippines, opposed to foreign involvement in Mexico. And, and our Socialist Party, in its, in its large majority, would be opposed to the U.S. intervention in World War I, to its great credit. Even the centrists and rightists, like this racist over here on the bottom left, Victor Berger, and that brings me to the racist of the Socialist Party. Now, the Socialist Party is a white man's party, is a white person's party. The Eugene Debs is notorious, and he will change his position to his credit as well, uh, that the Socialist Party has nothing special to offer the black worker. Well, if you don't have anything special to offer the black worker in this country, you, you have nothing to say about this country. You have nothing to say about this country. And if there are the great, the, the, the catastrophic blindsight, and, and we will see this all through looking at these newspapers, is race. Victor Berger is, is a racist. Debs is not a racist, but Debs will not break with the racists in the party, even though he is not. Um, now, that doesn't mean that everybody in the Socialist Party is a racist, but the, I mean, Victor Berger even said that socialism was in part the best defense the white race had, <laughs> you know? And, and if that's your position, I don't know how much we can, we can bring you into our movement the way we see it now. So uh, uh, race is incredibly important. The way that the socialist left largely saw race at this time was an economic condition and not a condition of 
white supremacy or white racism. So black people were oppressed, not because of white racism, but because of their past condition as enslaved people, right? That had, that had devalued their labor. It had, uh, uh, um, uh, they hadn't had education. They weren't raised to the level of white workers, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the issue with black people was a paternalistic raised them to the level of white workers, and that will solve the issue. Well, that wasn't the issue at all, right? And we're talking about 1900. We're talking about the, the height of, of imperialist racism. We're talking about the height of uh, Jim Crow's violent racism. And you needed to have something more to offer to that. Uh, and we're going to look at how black people responded to the basically non-offer of the Socialist Party and then the absolutely transformative change the Russian Revolution has on black politics. There is before the Russian Revolution and after the Russian Revolution when we talk about black politics. That did utterly change the framing of that question. And uh, more, than, more than any other impact, I think, on the American left, the the impact of the Russian Revolution on the question of race and how we view race in this country of for leftists was the most profound. Okay, and here we see uh, this is a, a map showing. There's a wonderful website done by the University of Washington uh, um, uh, where you can map the Socialist Party press in this period. And so this is where the Socialist Party press is and uh, how big it is. So you can see the East Coast, New York, and all of that. Chicago, Milwaukee's, and then <laughs> the hotbed of socialism, Oklahoma. Oklahoma had the highest percentage of, of any state of members in the Socialist Party. It got the highest percentage of vote. And very interestingly, its, its leader which was a man named Oscar Araminger, and he was an anti-racist. And so the Oklahoma Socialist Party would have been the only state socialist party, including Michigan, the only state socialist party to actively campaign for black suffrage during this period. And it was Oklahoma. Uh, so Oklahoma has a special place in my heart. There was even uh, an armed uprising in Oklahoma in 1913 called the Green Corn Rebellion that was put down dramatically. So Oklahoma went from a position of having literally, Oklahoma in 1909 had about 40 socialist newspapers. The state of Oklahoma had 40 socialist newspapers in 1909 to the last, you know, socialist was, was uh, hung in Oklahoma in 1950 or something. You know, I, it, it went way down. One of the things I want you to see is, is Michigan. Michigan is not a hotbed of the Socialist Party. Michigan is a hotbed of the Socialist Labor Party and do, not, Southern Michigan. Is. Uh, and it is also a hotbed of the pro-socialist labor party wing of the IWW, which is one of the most idiosyncratic groups of revolutionaries in American history. Uh, and so, you know, while Michigan will play a certain role, and, and Alan Ruff is on our call tonight, so we have the world's leading historian on the proletarian party, uh, uh, and it's Michigan's special, uh, um, Michigan's unique contribution to the Marx or the communist movement. Um, uh, but it was, and, and even though Michigan, the state of Michigan, the Socialist Party itself, which was led by Dennis C. Batt and John Carriger, was on the far left. It was the only state party to completely go to the left and the first state party to go to the left uh, after the Russian Revolution. It played a relatively minor role. Now, Ann Arbor did have two socialist newspapers. It had the Ann Arbor Call and the Ann Arbor Socialist. And the Ann Arbor Call for a summer was actually, in the summer of 1906, was actually printed daily in the summer. Uh, the only place you can find those are on um, a couple of faded copies at the Ann Arbor District Library. They have not been put on microfilm. But there are also a couple of copies as part of the radical collection at, um, at, in Lansing, if you wanted to see that. The place where Michigan is important to uh, the communist movement, I mean, really, I mean, it's important in many different ways, but the place where it's incredibly important is the Finnish language uh, speakers in the Upper Peninsula. So if anybody knows Hancock, uh, Calumet, it's wh where uh, the, the, the copper strike in 1913 happened, the Western Federation of Miners were strong in the UP. And at one time, Hancock, Michigan, little Hancock, Michigan, 
on the Keweenaw Peninsula had seven daily Finnish language socialist, or not daily, but seven uh, regular Finnish language socialist papers. Little Hancock, Michigan, it's smaller than Ypsilanti, had that many newspapers. And a couple of those presses up there would continue to have socialist and communist Finnish language newspapers in the Upper Peninsula. The last women's paper closed down in 1979. Uh, we don't think of the Upper Peninsula as a hotbed of communism, uh, but it was one of the strong Western, the Western UP was one of the strongholds of the communist movement and one of the strongholds of, of that Finnish group, which was so important. Again, there is no communism in Michigan without Finnish language speaking uh, 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 minors from the Upper Peninsula. Okay. So the International Socialist Review. The International Socialist Review is one of the essential newspapers of the U.S. left. It was founded, um, uh, it was published by Charles H. Kerr, but it was edited by Algie Simmons or Simons, uh, and uh, it began in 1900. And uh, for the first number of years, Algie is the editor, and you can see, you can see its progress here in the way it looks, in the way it acts, in the way it feels. And it goes from a relatively dry, um, theoretical, but an important, serious place of discussion. I mean, there are so many truly important articles in here, but it is dry. There's not a single image in it. Um, uh, it's, it's very much uh, a, a theoretical magazine. And it's, it's moderate, and, and it, it embraces it embraces, if not the revisionism of Bernstein in Europe, it embraces the idea of revisionism, right? It, it is a place where you can have those kinds of discussions, good or bad, right? Um, then in 1908, um, uh, a left wing has been developing in this country. So both a reaction to what's happening politically within the left and the Socialist Party, uh, the formation in 1905 of the Industrial Workers of the World was incredibly important. The development of um, the garment workers around this time and industrial unionism and what was called amalgamation, putting in putting unions together is a new idea. So you've got uh, a changed landscape between 1901, the founding of the Socialist Party in 1908. Between 1901 and 1908, the IWW was founded. Uh, and becomes a major force. And that changes the debates. And so all of a sudden, the main place of working class activity is not the ballot box. It's the IWW. And how do you relate the Socialist Party to the IWW? And in some places, there is a real relationship. In other places, there is not at all. In 1908, uh, Algae is fired. Uh, International Socialist Review um, and the left wing under Charles Kerr uh, and Mary Marcy take over. And I don't want to, uh, Alan again is on this call. There's, he's written a fantastic book, which I've just finished. Uh, um, uh, we called each other comrades on the history of the Charles H. Kerr company. Uh, Charles, we'll, we'll see more about him in just a moment, but this is the most important, we're, this, this talk is about publications and publishing. Charles H. Kerr, the International Socialist Review, and the Charles H. Kerr Publishing House are the most important pre-war, pre-Russian Revolution Marxist publishers, and some of the most important Marxist publishers in American history by a long shot. So after 1908, the paper becomes the vehicle for the left wing of the Socialist Party, and it becomes a place where debate is had and where the, uh, for example, where, where uh, uh, this man right here, William D. Haywood, Bill Haywood, uh, and the left wing are fighting uh, to, to take leadership in the Socialist Party. So Haywood is, is on the National Committee of the Socialist Party. At the same time, he's being tried in Idaho for murdering the, the former governor of Idaho, which he did not do. Um, and so the, the right wing is like, please get Bill Haywood out of here, everybody. And the left wing is, we finally got Bill Haywood in there. And there's a big fight around the character in the center of Haywood, and ISR becomes the vehicle for Haywood. It becomes the vehicle for the Haywood wing, which is the revolutionary working class wing of the movement at that time. We cannot say enough about Mary Marcy. We'll say a little bit more about her. Uh, and uh, so it, it hosts debates over industrial unions, constructivists, 
between syndicalists and what are called the sewer socialists. And they actually raised their hand and said, yeah, we like that term sewer socialists. Sewer socialists just means sort of municipal socialists, like the Milwaukee group, where socialism will be about, you know, connecting the sewer lines, that kind of stuff. Uh, the ISR also, uh, there is, you know, the debate that's going on in the United States might be surround, surround centered on industrial unionism and its relationship to a working class political party. In Europe, you have the debate between Kowski and Bernstein, between Rosa Luxemburg and Bernstein, between the uh, increasingly reformist pro-imperialist wing of the German Social Democratic Party and the, the old Marxist wing of the Socialist Social Democratic Party. But the, the anti-revisionists, Kautsky and those kind of people, they weren't industrial unionists. So there is a, a wing of anti-revisionism in the United States that looks very different than the anti-revisionism of Rosa Luxemburg and those people in Europe, because it's connected to the American realities of industrial unionism and the IWW. And there is a fan, uh, one of the leading figures of American and, and Alan and I have been recently talking about this man is Austin Lewis, why he's not talked about more. Now, Austin Lewis is in some ways a revisionist of Marxism, but he's fight, fighting the revisionists, the Bernstein revisionists in Europe, but on the basis of the industrial working class experience of the United States. And so his revisionism to Marx is to say that, you know, we've been looking for our way to the working class and how it's going to organize. And, and the working class is providing us with that answer. It's industrial organizing. And he writes some incredibly important uh, books, The Militant Proletariat, The Rise of the American Proletariat, and then a couple of important, he translates Engels' work and then writes a couple of important um, introductions to those translations. And what he's trying to do is to revise Marxism against the anti-revisionists who are anti-revolutionary uh, to that specifically American uh, uh, reality. So again, this is before Lenin and the Russian Revolution. If people know the figure of James Connolly, think of Connolly, how he goes through the Socialist Labor Party, to the IWW, to the Socialist Party, to the Irish Republican Socialist, or the Irish Socialist Republican Party. By the way, James Connolly is in the United States doing all of that in this period. Uh, so it's about trying to find the vehicle that will allow the working class to organize for its own emancipation. It can't just be a trade union struggle. It just can't be a parliamentary struggle. What is it going to look like? Um, to its great credit, the International Socialist Review opened its uh, pages to the Black left, specifically to the most important, in my mind, figure of the Black left in this entire period, Hubert Harrison. Uh, uh, it was the ISR also, and, and Hubert Harrison wrote a series of articles, which we'll see in a moment, attacking the white left and this, this for their racism. And this, and he wrote an article called the black man's bird. This isn't the white man's, this is our bird. We've got to carry you. Uh, and so this was a challenge, not just to let us in, but a challenge to white racism. Uh, it also, the ISR becomes the voice of Debs. And Debs is, you know, we were talking about MLK. And he can be all things to all people. But in the end, MLK was a revolutionary. And Debs was a revolutionary, meaning his politics, what he advocated, could not fit in to the existing structures of that society. And Debs, more than that, was a conscious revolutionary. He called himself one, right? Nobody had to go, is Debs a revolutionary or not? He'd raise his hand and go, yes, I am, happily. And Debs, did not play a role in leading the party. He played a role in leading the class. And I think that's where we sometimes get confused about how to deal with Debs. We want Debs to take this or that position that the Socialist Party was fighting over. But Debs, that's not who Debs is. Debs is a mass leader of the working class. He is not the factional leader of the Socialist Party. He will never be that. So if you want Debs to be that, he will never be that. I would argue that his role in being all things to all people allowed many millions of people to come to socialism, right? Through the character of Debs. So everybody relates to Debs. You have to relate to Debs. Morris Hillquit and the constructivists relate to Debs. James Buchanan and the industrial unionists relate to Debs. You must relate to Debs. He's the central figure. Um, 
uh, it remained revolutionary in outlook. Um, and in during World War One, it was closed down. And so all of the papers, nearly every paper we will see, will be closed down in between 1917 and 1919 under the Espionage Act. We can go online. You know, imagine if Facebook just said tomorrow, no more left wing and all left is gone. Right. All left. How would we put out our information? Right. It would, you'd have to figure out, you would all of a sudden be completely cut off from your audience, or a lot of, a lot of people would be, or the, not just Facebook, but these other platforms. And so the, the way the United States was able to do this, because they are not going to violate free speech, but they will say that the post office will not deliver seditious material. And so if you can't deliver through the post office to your subscribers, you have no access to to people. And so that's how all of these newspapers were shut down. They were not allowed to be delivered uh, through the news. And that meant that they were just cl uh, all, all, you know, your subscription dried up like that. You had no money to pay your staff. It just collapsed. But I do want you to notice the, how the, the uh, evolution of the ISR from this relatively dry theoretical to clearly a revolutionary, colorful, a uh, uh, um, motive newspaper here at the end. I think I believe this is 1916 or 17 uh, issue here. Okay, so here is Charles H. Kerr. Uh, he began as a radical Unitarian um, uh, uh, and, and, and Christian socialism is absolutely massive, especially in the 1890s. I think all the Christians in the United States would be horrified to learn how many Christian socialist churches there were in this country, but there were hundreds, if not thousands of Christian socialist congregations. And so that's, that was when most people in the early 1890s would have thought socialism, they would have not thought of Daniel De Leon in this country, they would have thought Christian socialists. Um, and out of that, you, uh, the specifically kind of Unitarian Christian socialism, Charles Kerr develops more and more to the left. Uh, and uh, he abandoned sort of Christian socialism to fully embrace not just Marxism, but the revolutionary potential of Marxism. So the Charles H. Kerr Company is the company most responsible for the publicizing and the publication of the works of Marx and Engels in this country's history. So everything you're seeing here, almost all of it, the first